Hey, boys and girls. Thank you. Can you feel the presence of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ among us today? Well, at least two of you can. Uh. At the end, don't let me forget, I've got a presentation to make. Somebody remind me because it's very possible I will forget by the time we get there. So, uh, someone remind me. At the end of service, somebody please remind me. Because by the time we get to the end of service, I may forget. There's a very good, distinct possibility that that reality will come to fruition. I just want to see how many big words I could say all at once. Show off my South Edge education. <laughs> Take that, all you PHSers. <laughs> Connie's back there going. We've been talking a lot over the last couple months about the Holy Spirit and, and what he's supposed to do. And when I say supposed to, he wants to. He wants to do the ministry that God sent him to do, but we believers quench and grieve the Holy Spirit. And we've seen at the beginning the enemy of the Holy Spirit's work is the devil and ourselves, that we walk in the flesh as believers and not in the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, we spent some time looking at this, this principle of walking in the Spirit of Jesus or walking in the flesh. And we've looked at this quite extensively to see the difference in what it means. And, and we saw what the fruit is if you walk in the flesh. And it was all sinful, horrible, nasty things. Then we moved over and we started looking at what is the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, okay? And so the, we, we walked through each of those gifts. And if you are a born-again believer in Jesus Christ and you have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you, you have gifts that the Holy Spirit has given you. You might have one or you might have three or you might have all of them, but you have some varying degree of amount of gifts that the Holy Spirit has given you as a believer. Then we saw that we as believers have the ability to quench the Holy Spirit in our lives. And we can use these gifts for God's service with other people, or we cannot use the gifts God has given us and thereby not doing the things that God has given us to do. And when we start walking in the Spirit, and we start using the gifts that he gives us, we saw that we start producing fruit. And we've seen that an apple tree produces? A pear tree produces? A Christian produces? The fruit of the Spirit, amen? So this is the third fruit of seven. We've looked at love and joy. Originally, I thought we would look at a couple, three different fruits each week. However, as the Holy Spirit does oftentimes, and what I think sermons are going to look like and what they really are are usually two different things, and that's a good thing. That means the Holy Spirit is doing what he should be doing, and I'm allowing him to do what he should be doing. So, so that's a good thing. Um, and so this morning, we're going to, we've got one, and we're going to look at peace this morning. But before we do that, let's read our scripture text. If you're able and you're willing, please stand for the reading and hearing of God's holy word. This comes out of Galatians 5, 22 through 26. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Let us pray. 
Oh, Father God, I thank you for this morning. We have seen your presence. We have felt your presence. We have truly experienced the presence of the Holy Spirit this morning. And Father, we thank you and praise you this morning, O oh Lord. Father, we just pray for your Holy Spirit to continue in this service, continue flooding this building, taking charge and control and leadership this morning. And Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit will preach through me now with power and authority. Father, I am a sinful man and, and I am unworthy to preach the gospel. But Father, because you have called me and Father, you have said you have sent me to reach the people, I'm up here, Father. And so, Lord, I pray for your Holy Spirit to have his way through me. Anoint me from on high, from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. And, Father, I pray that you will bind Satan, not allow him in here this morning, Father. And I pray that, Lord, each and every believer will not quench or grieve the Holy Spirit, but let us listen and walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh today, Father. And, Lord, how I pray that, God, if there's any unbelievers, that, Lord, they would be transformed and born again today, Father. Lead them to salvation. And, oh, Father, how I pray for the, the believers to walk in your Spirit, walk in your presence, and be who you want us to be, Father. And Lord, I pray now that you will add a blessing to the reading and hearing of your holy word in our hearts and minds. Change us, mold us, transform us now in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. All right, you may be seated. So, I literally have this morning one bullet point. One. So the three-point sermon out the window today, one bullet point, and that bullet point is peace. Peace is one of those words that is used often. You remember how we talked about love, and we say we love this, and we love that, and we love all of these things. Peace is one of those other words. You know, we want peace in our lives, we want peace on the national scale we want peace in the world peace 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 right and I mean there was actually a whole movement uh, what was it in the 60s and 70s of uh, peace loving hippies right you know what I'm talking about and and they just wanted peace 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 right and so we need to really look at the definition of the word peace in in Greek to understand what this means when we read in Galatians 5 that as believers we should have peace, okay? So if you're a born-again believer sitting under my voice this morning, whether in person or online, and you, you have the ability through letting the Holy Spirit work through you, through you to produce these fruits, we, we've seen that scripturally, we believe that, we attest to that, but we really need to understand what is this peace that we're told about? What does this mean? And so one of the things I want to point out um, before we really get into it, I think most of us, at least me, and I think most of us are in this category, think of peace on more of a national or global scale. When someone says we want peace, do you think they mean peace in their soul or do you think they mean peace at like a global or national level? Is that what we all kind of think? Yep, yeah, okay. So we're all, I, I was thinking... Check, check. All right, there we go. And so I thought we, were all, we would all be on that same page that when we talk about we need peace, we're talking, you know, globally or nationally. Um, I mean, you look at these big cities, and, and man, they, it's the epitome of the absence of peace, amen? The riots, the gangs, the murders, the violence, like all of these just horrible, evil things have taken over the major cities in, in our country, amen? You look at Russia and Ukraine, um, and, and that's just a small one. There are little many wars all over this world, over a hundred of them around the world, that you and I don't even hear about, okay? And so I wanted to talk about that because I believe that we are getting extremely close to Jesus calling the church home. I believe with all the signs of the end times, with all the things that Jesus said is going to happen, and he says when all of these, and guess what? All of these signs are happening. 
And so one of the things that really for me for the last few years has said it's, it's zero hour, we're close, has to do with this peace, okay? So I want to bring that to you this morning. Uh, in Daniel, the Old Testament, chapter 9, verse 27a, we read this. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. One of the things we need to recognize and realize and understand is that as we get closer to the return of Christ, there is going to be this peace agreement, okay? There is going to be a peace agreement among many nations. Um, that, it, the signing of that peace agreement starts what's called the, the tribulation period, the seven years of the tribulation. That is what we're talking about. In this Daniel 9.27, the he is the Antichrist, okay? The person who's going to raise up on the world scale and lead this effort of new world order is going to be the Antichrist. Which, by the way, I was just sent this this morning, and it just ties in perfectly. There's a new Captain America movie coming out, and guess what the name of the movie is? New World Order. I wouldn't lie to you. Friends, every president, every single president, all the way back to Federal Delano Roosevelt, FDR, has talked about a new world order. Every single one has talked about this new world order. The Antichrist is going to set up this global government, and he's going to create a peace treaty the, the word we use today is accord. And so let's look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 and 3. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. I think Allison would say amen to this. Um, but here's what happens. There's this peace agreement that is signed among many. Not every nation in the world will sign this. For the longest time, I was under the thought that the whole world would sign this. It's not. Many nations. How many is that? Not really sure. But many of the nations will sign this. That starts the tribulation period. And, and the first three and a half years is going to be peace. Okay? The first three and a half years is going to be peace. And we're told by Paul to the church at Thessalonica, when people are saying peace and safety, then comes sudden destruction. And people will not be able to escape it. Because the second three and a half years of the tribulation period is literally going to be hell on earth. Okay, it's going to be worse than anybody can imagine. And so we see this idea of peace that the world is wanting peace, peace, peace. The world is saying we need peace and, and we need love and we need all of these things. Check out this article from a couple days ago. It's from the Washington Post. And, it, and the title is, God bless you, Working to Widen Middle East peace over the course of years and decades israel has proved its readiness and eagerness for peace with all of its neighbors from the 1978 camp david accords with the egypt with egypt to the 2020 abraham accords initially with united arab emirates and bahrain jordan and morocco have critically established diplomatic relations with israel and we are hopeful that normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia will follow. This will be in the interest of the two countries in the entire Middle East. This is from three days ago. You see, what happened a week and a half or a week and four days, I guess that is a week and a half. A week and a half ago was Biden was over there in Israel. Did everybody know that? He was working to try and create peace between Israel and Palestine. For those that don't know that situation, Palestine has taken a chunk of land from what has always been Israel, 
they're, they're right beside each other, they border each other, and they've been fighting. Many of these countries have taken the side of Palestine because Palestine is Muslim. Saudi Arabia, Morocco, Jordan, Bahrain, those are all Muslim countries. Israel's Jew surrounded by Muslims. And what we're starting to see is more and more and more peace. This is one of those things that tells me we are extremely close because Israel is trying to do everything they can. I read one article this week that said one of the, the leaders in government in Israel has came out this week and said, we're probably willing to give up Palestine to create peace. And I about fell out of my chair because I could not believe it because that's one of their strongholds. It has been for a long time. And so I'm telling you all of this because we need to keep our eye on God's timepiece. We all wear watches or we look at a clock or we look at our phones, but we all have with us a timepiece. God's timepiece is Israel. And you can tell how close we are by what's happening in Israel. And the fact that Israel and Saudi Arabia are this close to peace agreement, wow. Put your seatbelts on, friends, because it's close. And so I just wanted to show that because the timing of God bringing us all these several months ago about the fruit of the Spirit and having me preach it today with everything that's happened over the last week and a half, that timing is unbelievable. It's a God thing, and so I, I had to show it to you. So, um, does peace in the New Testament, this fruit of the Spirit, only talk about a national or global peace? No. The word peace in the Greek, the definition is fivefold. There are five points to the definition of what peace means as a fruit. The first is a state of national tranquility, exemption from the rage and havoc of war. So this is the first idea of peace that when you read the New Testament and you read this Greek word, it, it talks about peace. And you know, even though we haven't had a war so to speak, on the shores of America in a long time, I honestly can't say that we're a peaceful nation. I mean, you look at the wars of gangs. <clears throat> you look at the war of good versus evil. You look at the war on drugs. Remember that in the 90s when, when, when we all had, all of us kids had dare shirts. Remember that? We were on a war on drugs. And, and we, you know, we've, we've got a war now between the right and the left, the conservative and, and the liberal, right? I mean, they, there are people that are intentionally stoking the fires to create a war between groups of people on our shores. And so even though, you know, we haven't been invaded, um, unless you count the border crisis, um, but other than that, we don't have an invasion here, but I don't believe you can say America's at peace. I don't believe that anybody in their right mind can look at America and say, oh, we're at peace. Because, man, it ain't. We, I mean, just look, just look at what happens when you drive down the road. I can't tell you how many times lately somebody will cut me off, run me off the road, almost hit me, and then honk or look at me or flip me the bird or, and I'm like, what are you doing? Like, you know, and this just happened a couple days ago and I'm like, that, that person is out of their mind. Like, what is going on? But what we're seeing is this rise in evil. And this rise of generations that have never been disciplined and have never been taught right and wrong that look at themselves and say, I don't do anything wrong, so it must be you. I swerved over and almost hit your front fender when I was in the left lane and you were in the right lane, but it must be your fault. Why didn't you see me and get out of the way? I mean, that's literally what happened, was it yesterday or Friday? 
Friday. And I'm sitting there going, you, what? Like speechless. And you can imagine how that is for me. And so we see this rise of fighting between people. So I don't think this one that we can say America has peace. The second part of the definition for peace is between individuals, i.e. harmony or concord. Um, this is more than just two people being nice or civil with each other, okay? This is the idea of having unity. So when we talk about peace among individuals, it's not just like, hey, how's it going, and, and going on your way. No, it's, it's actually deeper than that. It's talking about unity, coming together, agreeing on something, working together for a common good, and being together in a common goal. It's unity. And so when Jesus said, you remember in John when Jesus said, I pray for unity in the church? That's what he's talking about. He's talking about peace among believers. When believers have the same vision, the same goal, and that's one, to worship Jesus, and that's two, to lead people to salvation, and that's three, that's all we need, isn't it? Worship Jesus and lead people to Jesus. Isn't that what we should be all about? We shouldn't be about the clock. We shouldn't be about the color of the carpet. We shouldn't be about I feel comfortable or I don't feel comfortable. The problem is we don't have unity among people because we're selfish. Am I right or am I right? We want what we want when we want it and how we want it. And this goes back to the same problem about the discipline in not raising our kids with discipline and structure teaching them right from wrong, teaching them to be selfless. Because let me ask you, how many of us had to be taught to be selfish? That's my toy. I don't want you playing with my toy. And I'm talking about 12-year-olds now doing that. Used to be two-year-olds, right? But it's progressed into older and older. And now it's gone into even adults that are doing that. And so we don't have to teach each other how to be selfish we don't have to teach our kids how to be selfish. We have to teach them the opposite. And this goes back to the idea of people say, your kids are so good and so polite. And they listen, it's because I've taught them. I've raised them. I've disciplined them. I've raised them. And we are seeing the fruit of generations that are not being taught peace. Working together unity helping our brothers and sisters it's not about what i want it's not about what you want it's about what does jesus say and if we go back to the first fruit of the spirit which is love love is the opposite of selfish isn't it love is the polar opposite agape love is the polar opposite of selfish if you're selfish, you do not have the love of Jesus Christ living inside you. It's cut and dry. It's plain and simple. We have to have the love of Christ. And when we do, we're not selfish. And we'll have peace or harmony or unity among ourselves. But when we get to the place where we go, well, I think this. Well, I don't mean to offend you. I don't mean to be rude, but... It doesn't really matter what you think. When it comes to the things of God, the only thing that matters is what God says. It doesn't even matter what I say unless it's the word of God. And so this peace is coming together in unity. God bless you. And that's why Jesus said, I pray for peace among the church. Because he knew, he knew that when he created this institution called the church, that there were going to be humans inside of it, and humans are sinful, and sinful people are selfish, and selfish people don't have peace or unity among each other. He knew that about us, and yet he still loved us. Isn't that amazing? All right. So that's the second part of this fruit of the Spirit is peace. 
Um, the third is security, safety, prosperity, and felicity. Um, intense happiness. For the longest time, I thought the word felicity was just the name of a person. Anybody else? <laughs> yeah, that definition comes from like 400 years ago, so they used words that we don't use today. Somewhere along the line, someone's like, uh, let's go through the dictionary and pick a, a girl's name. Yeah, Felicity, cool, let's name her Felicity. I think some of the names come out that way, I don't know. But in the Old Testament, a peace offering to God Almighty was made for Jews trying to make peace with God. This peace offering was not to make peace, but rather to celebrate it in all other blessings of the, of the person who offers with respect to his position before God as a member of the covenant nation. Let me say that a little simp more simply. In the Old Testament, the Jews would take an animal they would sacrifice the animal and they would offer that animal to God because they would say, God, you have blessed us. God, you have given to us. God, you have given us security. God, you have given us safety. You have given us prosperity. You have given us an intense happiness. And God, we want to make you happy by offering you this peace offering. And so they said, they recognized, I am nothing but a speck of dirt in the presence of God. Church, when we as humans get to the place where we recognize and realize that we're nothing but a speck of dirt in the presence of God, we will come to a place where we recognize that we need to worship him Isaiah, we talked, we talked about worship on Wednesday. And Isaiah said, I have become undone in the presence of God. When we realize that we are nothing, despite how we were raised, that we're amazing and we can be whoever we want and do whatever we want. How many of you have been president? No, no presidents of the U.S. in here. How many of you have been in Congress? How many doctors? Our parents lied to us when they said we can be whoever we want. You realize that? I cannot be a black man. I cannot be a woman despite what this woke culture tells us. I cannot identify as anything other than who I am in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and so we need to realize who we are in the presence of of God. The, this peace offering could be male or female animal of the flock. The person offering laid his hands on the head of the offering that he had brought, and then he killed it. Okay? And the blood was sprinkled all around the altar. All the fat, the kidneys, and the call above the liver were burnt on the altar. An offering made by fire unto the Lord. Aren't you glad we don't got to do that? These being God's share, literally his bread. And the breast of the offering was waved by the officiating priest as a wave offering and the food for all the priests and their families. The right shoulder was then presented as a heave offering and was for the priest who officiated. The offerer and his family and friends ate of the offering on the same day or under some circumstances the second day. What remained had then, had then to be burnt on the altar. Thus what was eaten was fresh, fresh from the altar. The peace offering was accompanied by unleavened cakes mingled with oil, unleavened wafers anointed with oil, and leavened bread. What is clear about this offering is the way that everyone enjoyed something from it in fellowship with others. God had his portion. From the same offering, the priest, their family, the offerer, his family, and friends. The point is that these Jews would come together and they would share their offering with everybody. Isn't that amazing? You see, God had to teach the Israelites how to have peace with each other. 
first peace with God and then peace with each other. And so this idea of peace with God and with others, we can't do this on our own. How many times do we get offended on a daily basis anymore? How many times do people do things that are just stupid and selfish and, and ignorant and, and, and do things against us all the time? But God had to teach the Jews how to have peace with him and peace with each other. I think there's some significance. The Jews did the peace offering. Jesus prayed for peace in the church. And then today, the church is lacking peace. Because we don't have the grasp that it's up to us to first have peace with God and then peace with each other. Because when we're right with the Lord, when we're right with Jesus, guess what? It's going to be a lot easier to have peace with people around us. But when we're not right with the Lord, it's a lot easier to not have peace with one another. And so where do we go? Do we start with each other? No, we start with our relationship with the Lord. If you want fruit of the Spirit, this third fruit... The very first thing you have got to get right is getting right with God. You can't be right with each other if you're not right with God. And, and God, Jehovah God, was teaching this by making them do a peace offering. And, and I'm sure that over the, the decades it just became a ritual and the people lost the significance of what the peace offering was. Because you and I lose it too, don't we? You know, we lost it with coming up front. People, at the beginning, they came up and, man, they just wanted to worship the Lord and give God their, their everything, right? And then it just slowly started fading to where it was like, do I have to go up? It's not about us. It's about Him. It's about just saying, Lord, I want to be as close to you in your presence and being become undone in your presence. We get right with God first before we can ever get right with other people. And if you're not right with God, you're going to have the lack of fruit of the spirit of peace. All right, the fourth definition of peace used in the New Testament is called the Messiah's peace. And this is salvation. This is simply put, salvation. When a person receives the free gift of salvation, we are at peace with God Almighty. We are no longer God's enemy. Amen. You know, I don't think people really grasp that if they're unsaved, they are actually an enemy of God. You think about that for a minute. Paul was talking to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians, and he was talking about believers should not even marry unbelievers because he says, what does, what does Christ have to do with Belial? That word Belial is another name for devil, okay? And so he's saying, what do Christians who are of Jesus have to do with the devil? And so when a believer, a born-again believer, marries an unbeliever, literally what's happening is good and evil, dark and lightness, Jesus and Satan are coming together in marriage. And, and Jesus is very clear that light and darkness can't dwell together. We wonder why so many marriages are failing. It's because of one of two reasons. One, darkness and darkness have gotten together and married. And when two evil get together, what's going to happen? Evil. Or darkness and light. Jesus and an unsaved get together and you have light and darkness. Guess what happens when you do that? They're battling. And so this salvation is so important to understand and for to us as believers share with our unsaved family and friends that they are literally enemies of God. Check this out. Romans 5.1. There we go. Therefore... 
Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we see the only way to have peace with God now. In the Old Testament, they did a peace offering. Jesus comes and becomes the ultimate offering. And in the New Testament, now, the only way to have peace with God, to not be his enemy, is through Jesus Christ. Amen? And so, share that with your unsaved family and friends. Show them that in the scriptures. And then the fifth and final definition of peace in the New Testament is, is the third one there. Distinctly of Christianity, the tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ and so fearing nothing from God and content with its earthly lot of whatever, whatsoever sort that is. Now, I think we're hitting the nail on the head of what the fruit of the spirit of peace really is. So let me ask you something, friends. How many of us can say that we have a tranquil state of our soul? The word tranquil, it just kind of gives you this idea of soothing, relaxing, peaceful, calming. You know, if you listen to the waves and you close your eyes, it can just make you fade off into sleep, right? It's just tranquil. And it's soothing and calming. Can any of us honestly say that we have that tranquility in our souls? Now, it may come and go. It may one day be like, man, I'm so at peace with everything. It doesn't matter what's coming or going. I'm at peace with God. And then there are other days where things just burr up inside you and just get you lit up and the devil knows how to turn the flame up and, and, and you're ready to just go fisticuffs with somebody. Amen? But let's look at what this peace really comes from. It is a soul that is assured of its salvation through Christ. Let me share something with you, friends. If you are a born-again believer, you can have 100% assurity that you are saved. If you don't have that, you need to get on your knees and pray and go, God, I've got some doubts. I've got some questions. I need to understand this, Lord. Please make it clear to me. Because the doubts, if you're, if you're born again, if you're saved, the doubts come from the devil. And he wants to get in and make you question and doubt and lose the peace of God. And so if you're not sure, get on your knees and pray and ask the Lord to make it clear to you. And friends, here's the thing. If you are saved, God will make it clear. And if you're not, he'll make it clear. And he'll say, you need to get saved, get on your knees and ask Jesus into your heart. And, and here's the thing. Assured of salvation through Christ, not of yourselves. Nothing you've done. Nothing you can do. Nothing you will do. The only thing that we do is say, Jesus, I need you as my Lord and Savior. And he does everything. We just open the door and he takes care of the rest. And so we know if we're saved, so fearing nothing from God. That means that I don't fear that I'm going to hell is what that means. That means I don't get up and go, oh man, I sinned today. I might go to hell. No, no, I'm not going to go to hell. I am going to get disciplined. I will get corrected by the Lord. But I don't fear that because I know that God's correcting me and doing what's right. I have a fear of reverence, that I respect God, that I want to please Him, that I want to do what's right before God, that I want to do everything that I can to honor and give Him glory because He deserves it. That's what fear and reverence really means, that my life is not mine. I want to do anything and everything I can to please God Almighty.
their life flighting them? Okay, where are they life flighting them to? All right. Well, let's. Well, let's pray. Come on, everybody. Emergency surgery on his heart. Okay. Okay. Everybody in? Lord God, we just come humbly to your throne, Father. Thank you for allowing us this opportunity to pray for Dave. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to come together to, to give give you what you deserve and trusting you, Father, because we're laying this at your feet, Father. We're praying that, Father, you will step in and move and work in this situation, Father. We've been praying this morning. We've put him on our prayer list. But, Father, now we get to come together and pray specifically for Dave. And so, Father, we pray that right now in the name and power of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ, Father. We pray over Pat that, Lord, you'll keep her safe. And, Father, just direct her and guide her, give her wisdom and discernment and decisions that need to be made moving forward, Father. And, Lord, we just pray that you'll give her this peace that we're praying about, Lord, that we're preaching about, that we're hearing about this morning, that no matter what comes, we are assured of our salvation and we have peace with you, Father. So we pray for that peace right now over Pat, Father, and her heart, mind, and soul. And you tell us whenever we pray, Lord, that you'll give us peace that passes all understanding. So we pray for that for her right now, Father, believing that, God, you're in control of all of this. And so, Father, now we lay it at your feet that you'll be with the doctors, nurses, and surgeons, and all of them, Father. Lead them, guide them, direct them, keep the flight safe, and, Lord, get him there safe and sound. And so, Father, we trust you now in Jesus' name. Amen. You need someone to drive you? Isn't that amazing? Praying, t- preaching and talking about fearing nothing from God and content with earthly lot whatsoever comes. We're literally preaching and learning about that in the midst of that. We get the opportunity to pray. I'm telling you, God is a mighty big God. I'm telling you. I don't know how anybody could not believe in Jesus Christ. Oh, so let's look at these scriptures being used in the New Testament this morning, okay? Peace with God. Colossians 1.20, And by Him to, recon- to reconcile all things to Himself by Him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of His cross. Through the cross of Calvary, we can have peace with God. We can create peace. Uh, got them back out of order. Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. Friends, are you a peacemaker? Are you someone that tries to bring peace? First and foremost, peace with God and peace with others through Jesus Christ. Are you? Are you a peacemaker? Because the fruit of the Spirit is peace. And Jesus says that if I had red letters, that would be red letters because he said, Blessed are those peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Are you a peacemaker? Are you bringing peace? With God and with others? Are you leading people to salvation? Are you telling people about Jesus? Are you living in a way that people see Jesus in you? Are you living peacefully with God and with others? If we produce the fruit of the Spirit, 
we will try to live in peace. Romans 12, 18. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Here's something that we need to understand. If you stand for Jesus Christ, if you try to live for the Lord and you try to do what's right, there will be people who hate you. There will be people who go against you. There will be people who attack you. Here's the key to what we're learning this morning. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Are you doing your part to live at peace with all men? Are you doing your part to do what's right? Doesn't matter what they do. Are you doing what's right by the Lord? They might come up and smack you. Jesus said what? Give them the other cheek. Are you living at peace with others? As much as depends on you. Now, if someone keeps attacking and attacking, that's on them. Unless you're attacking back. And then you're adding fuel to the fire. You can't walk up to a fire, throw some gasoline, and expect it not to explode. Amen? If you walk up to a fire and you throw gasoline, what can we expect to happen? Ooh, right? Yeah, ask Luke about it sometime. And so, this is the way it is in situations in our lives. Are we adding fuel to the fire, or are we throwing water on it? When someone has a problem with us, do we keep it going and retaliate? Or do we go, you know what, God's got this. Vengeance is mine, thus saith the Lord. I'm not going to retaliate. I'm not going to come at them. I'm going to let God deal with it. Or are you doing everything in your power to make their life miserable? See, the way I read that is if I'm doing things to make people's lives miserable, I'm not living at peace. I'm not doing my part. You don't answer for anybody else but yourself. I answer for me. Am I doing my part to live at peace with people? Am I trying to do the right things and live at peace? Sometimes that means we shut our mouths. Sometimes that means we speak the truth. But we always do it in love. So as much as is in each of us as believers, are we living at peace with others? Here's another one that, that uh, has just been thrown out the window entirely. I can promise you that. I've lived this next one. I, 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 I was just talking to Herm yesterday when they were at the bridal shower. And I said, it's hard being a pastor these days. He goes, oh, it is. He goes, I don't envy you, you young bucks at all. It was hard when he was a pastor of the last, you know, 60 years. But now, he said, I, I wouldn't want to be a pastor today. The things you guys deal with and the way things are. I can assure you this next one is, is followed out less and less and less and less. This is being at peace with your pastor. 2 Corinthians 13, 11, Finally, brethren, farewell, be complete, be of good comfort, be of one mind, Live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Can we honestly say, that's actually the wrong scripture. I got ahead of myself. Sorry. What I just said, hold that thought for the next one. This one is live in peace. That means don't worry. That means forgive. That means get along with each other. Get rid of anger. Look what Paul says. Finally, his last thing, he says, I'm going to leave you with this. Finally, brothers, see ya. Become complete. That means become like Christ. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. That's unity. Live in peace. And when you do these things, he says, the God of love and peace will be with you. 
Does that mean that if you don't do those things, the God of love and peace will not be with you? I think sometimes, I know, I don't think, I know, when we continually smack God in the face, he says, fine. You've made your bed, now you can lie in it. It's like in the old days, they would teach a young kid to swim by throwing them in. Sink or swim, baby. Amen? We've all known people like that, haven't we? <clears throat> and when we continually smack God in the face, go against him, don't listen to what he teaches us and leads us and shows us and tells us in his word, and when we continually go against what the scripture teaches, God says, okay, I'm going to throw you in the deep end. You're going to either come back and rely on me or you're going to fail. And that's what God does to us. Because he'll only give us so many chances and then say, okay, discipline's here. The God of love and peace will be with you if you do those things. How many of us can honestly say that we're becoming more and more complete in Christ? We're becoming more like Jesus every day. How many of us can say that we're living with comfort of the Holy Spirit? That means we're walking in the spirit, not the flesh. How many of us can say that we're in one mind, we're in unity? How many of us can say that we're living in peace? How many of us can say we're doing those things that Paul closes this letter with? I think if we were really honest with ourselves and honest with the Lord above, many of us can't say we're doing a lot of those things. I think many of us can't say, you know, I'm really, really doing great in this area. I've really picked up the pace and, and I'm doing these things, Pastor. I think many of us would say, you know, actually, I've got a lot of room to grow. I've got, I've got some mileage to make up that I've been slacking on. I need to pick up the paces before the Lord comes back. And then the, the last one is being at peace with our pastors. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 and 13 says this. We urge you, brothers, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. You see what Paul is telling the church at Thessalonica? is to look at the pastors, those who are over you in the Lord, those who have that leadership of pastoring, who are over you spiritually, to look at them highly. You know, a couple weeks ago I said that I was going to change things back a little bit. You know, I've always tried to just kind of be, be among us and, and, and be one of the people, and we've lost respect as a church to the office of pastor. And, and we've lost that respect that, you know what, pastors are called to lead us. Pastors are called to be over us. You see that? It says, over you in the Lord. That we are to look at pastors with respect, to lift them up, to help them, to respect the office and the person of pastor. And remember I said I'm going to change things a little bit. Because we've lost that respect for the office of pastor. And when we get back to the place where we respect the people who are over us, we esteem them highly in love. That word love again, isn't that something? That word love is all over the place. And we get back to the place where we go, you know what? We need to respect the pastor. They deal with a lot. We need to respect the fact that they pray and cry and work on sermons and they get beat up by the Lord and they try to lead us in the right way. And they're doing this for us. I do these things and I preach these messages and I prepare 
and, and I try to get you where you need to be because I love you. It's exhausting. It's, it's just mindfully exhausting. I go home and take a nap, and people go, all you did is stand there and talk for a half hour, 40, however long I'm up here. I said half hour and went. People go, all you do is stand there and talk. You don't understand what I, what I as a personal person's human standpoint, pour in to letting the Holy Spirit work through me. It is exhausting. And, you, you know, I was talking to another preacher the other day, and they go, people just don't understand. I said, they can't. I told this, pa- this young pastor that I was talking to, I said, they can't understand. You need to understand they can't understand. You can tell them until you're blue in the face, but until someone's came up here and, and relinquished all control to the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit had his way through them, they can't understand how exhausting it is. And I'm not trying to lift myself up so you guys go, wow, that Casey, he's amazing. It's not what I'm trying to do. But what I am trying to do is get us back to a place where we remember that pastors are called by God. That pastors are over us in the Lord. That we need to respect the men that God's called to lead us. And give them the love that is so deserved. These aren't my words. These are the Apostle Paul. So if you want to argue it, take it up with God. I'm giving you the scriptures. All you've got to back up, if you think otherwise, is your opinions. And I've already told you, we don't care about those around here. We only care about God's. And so if we're going to live at peace with people... We're going to have to have a whole different outlook on life. We're going to have to change how we do things, friends. We're going to have to first change how we look at the Lord and have peace with Him. Then we can start to have peace with one another. And in the church, if we're like-minded and we've all got the same vision and we've all got the same path and we're heading towards where God's leading us, it's going to create unity. Because what we're going to do is we're going to say, you know what, it doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what my opinion is. It doesn't matter how I like things. What matters is what God's leading. What is the Holy Spirit of Jesus leading in our church? What is the Holy Spirit leading in my life? Can we back it up with Scripture or not? And when we start to get unity among ourselves... We're going to see God use this church again. And we're going to see people starting to get saved again. Because, friends, if it doesn't bother anybody else that a person hasn't got saved in this church other than than my two recently, we've got a problem. We've got a heart problem. Because we don't love people enough to want to see them saved. And so we need to make sure we're getting to a place where we want to see people saved again in this church. Because if we're not seeing people get saved, and we're not worshiping like we should be, and we don't have unity among ourselves, you know what the next stop is? We lock the doors. That's a fact, friends. And I, for one, don't want to see that happen. I, for one, don't want to see God say, I'm tired of playing games with you, Sunrise. Enough's enough. I want to see people start coming again. I want to see people start getting saved again. I want to see that baptistry be used weekly or every few weeks like we used to. Remember that? You realize we've done like almost 100 baptisms in this church in nine years since I've been here? And over the last two years, we've done a handful. We, we've seen God do amazing things. And we have the same problem that we've been dealing with. We can't get out of our own way. And so, I invite you to peace this morning. I invite you to a peace that only the Holy Spirit can give you. First with God then with one another and then as much as possible with everyone else out in the world and I invite you this morning that if you're
born again. You are a believer. Come up and pray for that peace that we've been reading about this morning. And if you're not saved, you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. I'm going to invite you to make the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. And that's making peace with God through Jesus Christ. There's only one way to heaven, one way to salvation, and that's through the precious shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And so if you need salvation today, I'm going to invite you, grab me, and let's ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. If you are a born-again believer, I just want to invite you this morning to come pray for that peace that only God can provide. Let's pray together now. Father God, we love you and bless you and praise you this morning for this word. We thank you, Father, for the ability to pray over Dave and Pat, and we just pray again for them, Father. Lord, we pray this morning that, Father, your Holy Spirit would lead any unbelievers to salvation today. We pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would just lead any backslidden believers to come to peace this morning, Father. We pray that you will work in the hearts and minds. Lord, that you will truly give us peace that passes all understanding. And Father, I pray now that your Holy Spirit conviction is so hard, so heavy, so powerful, that anybody being convicted will not run from you, but run to you, Lord. Father, we love you. We bless you in what you're about to do at this altar. We will praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said,